Good morning. Happy Sunday. Welcome to our worship from home service here with uh, Maitland Presbyterian Church. Thank you for joining us today. A few announcements before we begin. The first is that we are in a congregation-wide conversation about anti-racism. There are a lot of ways you'll see coming out over email on how you can engage that. Uh, we're doing a book study on the book White Fragility. We have an anti-racism Bible study from the denomination that we're doing. Uh, there's media recommended on Friday that you can watch over the weekend. And then on Tuesday mornings over Zoom, we have a talk back session uh, where we'd love to have you join us to have be a part of that conversation. All of our other ministries are continuing as well with our online worship from home uh, with things like yoga and the mental health group. So all of that to say, make sure you check your email because there's a lot of information right now. Um, several of you have asked, when are we going to be back in person? Uh, the session meets on Tuesday night and continues the discussion and discernment about that. And as we have information, we'll share it with you. But for today, let's get to worship. Uh, so we'll start off with uh, uh, the introduction from our children's director, Vanessa Irvin. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you for checking in with me. Well, we're going to continue learning this week about how God wants us to love everybody. Last week, we learned that we're all part of one big family and God is our father and that we should love each other because we're a part of this family. Well, this week, we're going to talk about another way that we're all connected. And I'm going to use this story right here, and it's going to be all about diversity this week. So check in with me after the message so you can hear all of our story. Thanks, Vanessa. Uh, now let's uh, open our worship time with a, a worship song from Matthew Stone. Let's sing along. You are here, moving in the beats. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. You are here. A promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are, we make a miracle work, a promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. Miracle. 
co-worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, Working. You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working We make a miracle worker Promise keep a light in the darkness My God, that is who you you are, you are we make a miracle work a promise keep a light in the darkness my God that is who you are that is who you are Well, before we get to our scripture reading this week, we are so grateful to share with you a conversation that we got to have with Dr. Brian Blunt. Dr. Blunt is the president of Union Presbyterian Seminary in Virginia. He is a New Testament scholar and pastor. And he was one of our professors at Princeton Seminary, which is how we know him. So let's listen together to a few minutes from our conversation with him. So we read an article that you wrote uh, this week on social media, and you said, if white Christians were to ask me, a black Christian, what they should do in response to the spiral of racially sparked violence into which we are rapidly and inevitably descending, I have pondered the response I would give. I, would you be willing to share more about how you answered that question? Yes. As a matter of fact, um, I just had a conversation with um, one of uh, a pastor in uh, Charlotte. We have a Charlotte campus, and he asked me exactly that same question. <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> yes. So um, uh, there were three things um, that I told him I would start with because, I, I mean, it's a comprehensive question, and it's an ongoing one, as you might imagine. Um, I said, uh, well, these are the three things that I thought about. I thought about um, uh, being a voice within your own friendship circles, uh, speaking within the communities in which we find ourselves. I very often find that people um, become paralyzed because they think about um, the grand um, problem and issue and how they can address the whole problem and issue. And uh, sometimes uh, when we think in that way, we begin to think, well, I don't have the wherewithal, the resources or the capability to speak to such a large, massive issue. And systemic racism, for example, is a large, massive issue. But one can begin in small ways by engaging um, family members, congregation members, uh, people in our workspaces um, to begin in terms of conversation and transparency about issues related to privilege and supremacy and race and um, how those issues are inter, um, interconnected within our lives and the lives of those who are around us. Now, um, if we're in a context where we're not often engaging uh, people who are of a different ethnicity or race than us, um, that's still fine. Begin the conversation in one's own community and then out of that community, try to reach out through a congregation, uh, perhaps to persons from a different community to begin to have those interpersonal conversations. But I think um, what um, it's important for me is, as I was writing that, um, that piece was to think that um, white Christians um, have um, and should have dialogue partners with other white Christians as a starting place. Um, to be honest, to be open, to be willing to challenge, to be willing to be challenged about one's perspective. Um, and in a way of trying to learn and grow. As you all know, um, the classroom was a perfect place for that type of thing to happen. I wish churches could be more like classrooms in that regard um, so that we could um, um, have a safe space to engage on these kinds of critical issues. So um, I've been suggesting that people think about authors who could be helpful. I think of Willie Jennings, who is uh, teaching up at Yale, 
or um, uh, um, a Cornell West, of course, who is a name most people know and uh, who's been writing for decades on these kinds of issues. Um, there are uh, some things that are happening now, um, a 21-day race challenge that the congregation I'm in, Second Presbyterian Church here in Richmond, um, that's my home church now, um, we're beginning that conversation. It's a predominantly white congregation. I'm excited to see that they're taking on um, that challenge. And they're different versions of the challenge, but um, they're whole sets of readings and documents to be shared. So I, I, that's one thing. A second thing um, 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 I would like to suggest that churches create partnerships for concrete change and alliance with African-American churches, um, not just to do things like worship um, and and um, um, that's important. I think that's really important to have partnerships in worship. Um, but to think about um, key um, issues and problems in the community um, where we're located, to prioritize them and to engage them so that one is not just thinking in a kind of um, theoretical sense, but what are some key issues related to um, um, systemic injustice or racial injustice um, that um, um, impact if not my community, the community of the church with which our church and congregation is partnered. And then to begin to strategize about how to um, deal with those particular issues. And then third, um, I would suggest that um, uh, um, congregational members um, engage uh, the political leadership at their local and state levels to speak about concrete legislative change that could happen in your locality and also in the broader area of the state and, and many churches have the capability to do that um, even on a more national level um, but as i um, have said in multiple congregations over the last uh, several months um, uh, white christians um, tend to um, have good connections with people in leadership um, either in their jobs or in their uh, political establishment. And to use those connections in a positive transformational way um, to speak to the issues of concern um, about systemic racism that's happening um, right now in our country. So those are three things that I, I suggest we start with. And I, I really try to keep um, people from, from, from um, going catatonic because they look at the big picture and say, I can't, that's just too big. Right. Um, but there are ways in which we can um, narrow our focus, and in narrowing the focus, have a dramatic impact that can grow. Well, that was that was awesome. Uh, you know, one thing that uh, Dr. Blunt mentions later in the conversation was the importance of the first few chapters of the Gospel of Mark. And the importance of Jesus's teaching about new wineskins. So that's where we'll start today. We'll be in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verses 21 and 22. Okay, Jesus said, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old, and the worst tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost, and so are the skins. But one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. So this portion of Mark comes from a time when there was this tremendous tension between the way things had always been and the thing that God was trying to do. The community Jesus was speaking to had long known the importance of the laws God had given them. They had rules and infrastructure and leaders whose whole purpose was to make sure that these laws were upheld. But then Jesus came and suddenly God was doing something completely new. God was doing something through Jesus that was breaking a lot of the rules. It was changing the way that things had been, the way that they had always been for the community. Over and over again, they saw Jesus choose people over protocols. For as long as they could remember, you couldn't do anything on the Sabbath. But Jesus fed the hungry on the Sabbath. For as long as they could remember, they had to fast. And there were specific rules about the fast. But then Jesus says, don't fast while I'm here with you. God wasn't only making some small changes to the way things had always been. God was doing something completely new. Absolutely. God was doing something completely new in and through the people, but the people still didn't get it. And so when the people still didn't get it, Jesus used an image that they would understand. He used the image of wineskins. 
Jesus said, No one puts new wine into old wineskins. The wine will burst the skins. They knew that was true. It's not something we're familiar with as much. But, but they put wine into animal skins. And wine skins were animal hides they used to contain wine. When you'd first put it into the wine skin, it would stretch and expand as the wine filled, and then it would hold it in place. But you couldn't take an old, worn out, or stretched, brittle wine skin and put some brand new wine in it because the skin would break and the wine would get spilled everywhere. Jesus was new wine. God was doing a new thing. You couldn't take Jesus and fit him into the way things had always been. You couldn't take the container of the old laws and policies of the temple and just add a little Jesus into it. It would take a brand new container, a brand new framework, a new way of knowing God, a new plan for God's people to experience grace and be made into one people. Which meant setting aside the old wineskin. Setting aside old containers isn't easy. You know, we see this in the scriptures as the Pharisees clung tight to the old ways of doing things. They pushed against Jesus every chance they could. They questioned him and challenged him and used the law to try and trip him up. Maybe the Pharisees were scared of the changes Jesus was bringing. Maybe they weren't ready to give up on the way things had always been. Maybe, and most likely, they were scared of giving up that power the old ways afforded them as religious leaders in their community. You know, old wineskins are hard to let go of especially when you're the one who benefits from them the most. But the implication of what Jesus taught is that the old wineskins, the old way of life, is completely incompatible with the new thoughts, the new message, the new feelings of the new wine. And when people are incapable of change, unfortunately for them, they get left behind because the new wine is more important than the old wineskins. Jesus is the new wine. When he poured himself into old wineskins 2,000 years ago, the world burst open. So God provided a new wineskin, the church. But here's the thing about wineskins. Even the new ones get brittle and broken over time. So as we look at the upheaval right now in our community, right now as we talk about racism together, what we're talking about is so much bigger than any one of us and our feelings about one another. It's about the systems the rules, the racist infrastructure that keeps things the way they've been for 400 years. Not just in our communities, but even through the church. Right now, God is doing something new. Right now, God is pouring new wine to burst open these systems and create something completely new. But to really take hold in our world, this new wine needs new wine skins. And that's where you come in. You see, if you're not willing to change, if you cling to what was, you will be left out of what God is doing right now. God can't put his message into unchanged lives. You can't just say or tweet or post that Black Lives Matter, and, and they really do. And then go and live the same way that you did and accept the same things you did last year. You can't, and we as a church can't either. We need to become the new wineskins that Jesus was talking about. It's not something we'll accomplish overnight, but we start right now by praying and talking and studying and listening together. So will we hold tight to the old? Will we let our fear of change, our comfort with what we've always known, our desire to leave in place the systems that benefit us, will they make us cling tight to old, worn-out wineskins? Or will we set them aside so that Jesus can pour new wine into us? Jesus has broken old wineskins open before, and Jesus is doing that again now. As we let that word from God echo today in our hearts from the Gospel of Mark, this is the time when we also give our morning offering. You can give online through text message. You can mail a check into the church. However you give, thank you for giving to the work and ministries of Maitland Presbyterian Church. So now let's listen to this musical offering from the Gants and give God our offering.
Thank you for supporting the work of Maitland Presbyterian Church uh, now and in the future through your gifts. Let's spend some time in prayer. As we go to prayer today, we're especially mindful of the anniversary of the Pulse tragedy. I still will be lifting that up in prayer as well. Let's go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you for the conversations and the change that we see happening even now in our communities and around the world. God, we pray in the middle of pandemics, in the middle of difficult conversations, in the middle of upheaval, God, help us to be obedient to you. Where there is injustice, may our words and actions reflect your justice as it rolls down like water into our communities. Where there's inequality, God, help us to work for equality and to see the own biases that we carry within our hearts. God, we pray for the work and ministry of our church. We pray that you would give us courage to be obedient to your spirit, that you would be with the sick and provide your healing, with the grieving and provide your comfort. And God, this week we are especially mindful of those that lost loved ones in the Pulse tragedy. God, we pray that you would provide comfort to their families. We remember the names of those who were lost. And God, we pray for a day when all people love and care for one another as children of God and equals before you. Bless us, O oh God, that we would have courage to speak truth. Help us to be the hands and feet of Christ that those who need us the most will find us there. We join our voices now and pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We'll go from this time and place to, to, to become those new wineskins, uh, to be filled with that new wine from Jesus. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, be with those you love, and be with those who know and love. Amen. Mm. We'll stick around. It's time for Sunday School with a book from Vanessa. Let's listen. Hey, good morning, guys. Thank you so much for checking back in and, and joining me for our story this morning. Uh, we are reading It's Okay to Be Different, and this book is by Sharon Pertil. Um, so let's give it a listen, shall we? We are all different. Do you know each and every person is different? It's true. If everyone looked and acted the same, how would we know who was who? Some kids love to swim, and some like to hike. Some like to dance, and some love to bike. We're all different. Some kids love the color blue, and some adore yellow. Maybe pink is your favorite color, like this little fellow. Some kids love to build towers out of blocks. Some kids enjoy wearing different colored socks. We're all different. Some kids have blonde hair and light colored skin. Some kids have dark hair and dark colored skin. Some kids are big and some kids are small. Some kids are short and others are tall. We are all different. Some kids are great at science and math. Other kids choose a whole nother path. Perhaps playing sports or music's their thing. Some kids play an instrument while others can sing. We are all different. Some kids wear glasses that help them to see. Some kids talk with an accent that's different from me. Some kids get to ride in cool looking chairs. They take the ramp while others take stairs. We are all different. Some kids have glasses, crutches, wheelchairs, and slings, but it is never okay to make fun of those things. Even though we don't all look or act or sound alike, one thing is true, every child is an individual, a person like you. You should always be kind to those who are different from you because to them, you are different too. Remember, it's okay to be different. It's okay to be you. You were made to be different. You were made to be you. Who do you know who is different from you? 
If you have noticed differences, maybe they have too. What about them makes them different from you? And if you wanted to show them kindness, what would you do? Hey guys, thanks for listening to our story this morning. So today's book was all about diversity. Do you know what diversity means? Well, diversity means differences, right? For instance, say you collect stuffed animals. Do all of your stuffed animals look the same? No, right? Maybe some are small. Maybe some are Pokemon. I know this is a Pokemon. I don't know which one, but maybe you have some that look like Pokemon. Maybe you have one that's really, really big, like this pupper's right here, right? So none, not usually, you know, your stuffed animals don't all look the same, right? So if you were looking at this group of stuffed animals that I have here, you would say I have a very diverse group of stuffed animals. And what I'm saying is, is I have a group of very different looking stuffed animals. Put these guys over here. Um, and that's what our book today was about. So it's okay to be different. It's all, it's, it's talking about how we're all different. And maybe what makes us different is um, what we like to do. I like to read and maybe you like to play ba basketball. Um, maybe uh, my skin or my skin is white and maybe yours is brown. Or uh, maybe, not maybe, my hair is straight, maybe yours is curly, right? And last week we talked about how we're all part of the same family, how God is our heavenly father because he created us and that we are all brothers and sisters on this earth um, because he created us and because we are all part of this giant family, this worldwide family, uh, we have to love each other, regardless of what we look like. This week, I want to talk about another way that we are connected. Um, the Bible tells us in Genesis 1.27 that God created humanity in God's own image. Now you're saying, Miss Vanessa, I don't even know what that means. Well, let's break it down. God created. Created is made. So God made and humanity is every person on the earth. So you could say, God made people, okay? And then it says, in his own image. So what does that mean? That means they were made to look like him. That means that you are made in the image of God. That means that I am made in the image of God. Let's see, where else can we go with this? Uh, maybe, let's say, a person in Australia that has that really cool accent, made in the image of God. What about a person in Japan who eats different foods, speaks a whole other language, has a different culture? They were made in the image of God, that's right. What about, let's say, a person in Canada, a little closer to home, but way north, live in the snow, they speak English, but it's a little different English. Um, are they are, that's right, made in the image of God. Maybe uh, this kid, a kid at your school that has brown colored skin. They're made in the image of God. So how important is God to us? He's really important, right? I mean, we dedicate a whole day out of the week to him, right? We come to church and we, we sing praises to him and we pray to him, you know, because we love God. He gives us a lot. He gives us strength to do really hard things and, um, he, um, he blesses us with good families and good friends, and he blesses us with backyard pools in and, and Florida in the summertime. And, and we love God because he does all those things for us. Well, here's another way that we can love God. We can love those that are made in the image of God. And that's every person on this earth because everyone is made to look like God. So we can love God by loving others. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to love, even if the person looks different than we do. He wants us, he wants us to have a lot of diversity. He wants us to have diversity in our friend groups and in our churches and in our parks and on our playgrounds. Because differences are what make us beautiful, guys. 
how boring would it be if everyone looked like you or looked like me? I mean, just imagine a bunch of Miss Vanessa's running around, hugging everybody that they came across and saying, hey, Sugars, how are you doing today? Nobody wants that. No, nobody wants that. Another question for you, what would, um, what would you learn from somebody who looked like you? Well, if you look like me, that means you probably do the same things as me. So I'm probably not gonna learn a ton of new stuff from you. If, if we invite other people who don't look like us to be a part of, let's just say, your, your lunch group at school, maybe when you sit down at lunch, if you, if you invited someone who looked different from you to that group, you could learn so many things. You could learn something different. Maybe you learn about a festival that they, they celebrate in their culture. That would be pretty cool. Or maybe you learn that that person that looks really different from you likes the exact same TV show that you do. How cool is that? You have something in common. See, when you learn more about others, especially those who are different from you, you can learn to love them better. And when we love others, we love God. Well, that's all I've got for you this week. Hope you enjoyed our story and enjoyed the lesson. And I will be praying for you guys this week and I will see you right back here with a new story next week. Bye.